Good morning. Today we are going to talk about two more chapters in Permaculture, a designer's manual. And I'm going to tell you about something that I feel like I disagree a little bit with Bill Mollison about, and that's going to be further along. But it's kind of an interesting idea where I think I may have improved just a tiny bit on one of his theories about order and chaos by by implementing and improving it with another theory that he he has put forward already. So we're going to talk about that a little bit later. We're going to start though with complexity and connections. So this is permaculture, a designer's manual. It's chapter 2.8 right now and then we'll do 2.9 in a few minutes. Um, so complexity and connections. He he starts by talking in this chapter about flat landscapes and how in nature a flat landscape, flat landscapes are found, but they tend to be less diverse. And so when we create a flat landscape, what we tend to do is, um, is scale back the complexity of that landscape. Uh, to something more simple uh, and something potentially less um, less robust, less um, less able to survive shocks and that sort of thing. Um, so he 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 indicates that you know that hum this human tendency toward simplifying systems is actually a tendency away from resiliency, and that we want to. Uh, we want to push forward to toward resiliency rather than towards simplicity um, in our landscapes. Uh, so what when you think about flat landscapes, you think about a desert, uh, you think about a flattened field, you think about your lawn, right? So the desert, a desert that is an evolved ecosystem, those ecosystems have been have been around for thousands of years. And they can be very complex. They can have thousands of, uh, of creatures that have learned to work together in that ecosystem to make a very complex ecosystem. But when we take a complex ecosystem and you know, slash and burn, make it a very simple eco ecosystem, what we do is we eliminate a lot of the species and we end up with a very simple ecosystem, not nearly as complex as that of a desert. So what we end up with is something that that needs, it's, it's a situation we've created and quite often in many environments can use our help to regenerate this, uh, this space. This is one of the reasons that Mollison discourages people from going out into the wild and cutting down trees and creating a, um, a, a home and a permaculture uh, environment in the forest. And the reason is that there are a lot of degraded landscapes that need our attention, number one. Number two, what you're essentially doing is you're falsely creating a degraded landscape and then then rebuilding it, which uh, he says nature doesn't really need. And I probably agree with him, even though it's painful to admit, because honestly, I'd love to see myself out there in the wild. I am not out there in the wild. I live in, in a, uh, a neighborhood with a whole lot of people with a whole lot of lawns, that is a degraded landscape. That is a landscape that has very little complexity. And so that presents for me lots of opportunity to build complexity. And honestly, it is really gratifying to work in a degraded landscape and rebuild it, repurpose it, make it more complex. This involves sometimes adding a diversity of like m levels. So creating spaces that are higher than other spaces. So you have different species that survive in the drier, higher areas than in the lower, possibly slightly damper areas. So regrading and replanting. When you add an element to your system, and this is, this is straight from the chapter uh, 2.8, uh, when you add an element to your system, you add a level of complexity. If you have two elements in a system, the level of complexity, according to Mollison, tends to be two times two. So your level of complexity is, is four. 
in that situation. That means there are potential for like four interactions between these two elements. It just seems to be kind of the natural order of things, the way that nature works. Add another element, so now you've got three elements in your system. You've got three elements times three, which gives you a level of complexity of nine. Add four elements, a level of complexity of 16. So you see, every time you add an element, you add sort of an exponential level of complexity to your system, which gives it more resiliency um, and also helps you take advantage of more resources in more complex ways. And these interactions, we can plan for some of these interactions. Like if you have chickens and you plant comfrey, you can plan for the fact that the chickens are probably going to nibble on your comfrey. And your comfrey will probably benefit some from chicken droppings. It also pulls up nutrient from the subsoil. So those are complementary things, but you don't know everything that's going on between those chickens and those, that comfrey, and you also don't know everything that's going on in the environment that you're creating between just not just those two elements, but those elements and the rest of the environment, like the grass, like the dandelions, the other things that still remain. Add another element to that system, say an apple tree, and now you've got, you've got interactions between the chickens, your apple tree, and your comfrey, all of which could conceivably be benefiting each other. So your apple tree drops apples, chicken eat the apples, your comfrey, the chicken nibble on the comfrey. Um, you have, obviously, you might want to restrict the chickens from eating the comfrey to the ground, but comfrey, once it's established, very, very sturdy uh, plant, so it can endure some of that. Uh, and you've, uh, so you've got all of these kind of, you don't understand now, and you've just got three elements, you don't understand everything that's going on, right? You have to go on faith a little bit. Um, add another element to that system and you get another level of complexity. And so the trick to building complex systems is adding things and ideally um, having some sense of where you're going with it, but you have to go on faith to a certain extent. So um, as you build that complexity, you build a more resilient system, you have more organisms working each other with each other, you've got these exponential levels of complexity, and you are recreating what would potentially happen in nature over millennia uh, in a much smaller period of time. So, so many possibilities of connections, difficult to understand all of them. Um, some of it will be based on your design, and some of it will be based on the connections that they make without you even really understanding them. So that is complexity and connections. We're going to move on now to order and chaos. And it's kind of related to the whole complexity connections part. Now, order and chaos are different from the, when, with the way that this permaculture describes order and chaos, it's different from the way you think about order and chaos. When you go out to the wilderness and you look around, it looks chaotic to you. But that system has reached a state of equilibrium, meaning what it produces, it can also digest. So everything that those trees are making, there are other organiz organisms in that system that are using those materials and then eventually feeding them back to the trees. So it's a it's a, it's a system in balance. Uh, it is a system in equilibrium. And that is, that is order. Order is a system in equilibrium. Now, disorder is caused when you have a disruptive uh, action, a disruption, a disruption in the, the, the ordinary uh, order of things. And so say you've got a forest fire that goes through, or you've got somebody who comes through and slashes and burns um, this forest. Now you have a system that is in chaos. It is, it is not a system that is, um, is, is taking advantage of all of its resources. Now, if you get a smaller forest fire, great. That is actually a situation that the, the forest can take care of 
and regrowth. You get a massive forest fire. If you get people slashing and burning a rainforest, then you take a system in order, you put it into a disordered system, and so now you have what we would call chaos. Your yard, if you are mowing down everything every week and throwing away your grass clippings, you are perpetuating a state of disorder. You're perpetuating a state of, um, of you're perpetuating a system that needs inputs. You need to put fertilizer on that. It is not a self-sustaining system. It is not a system in a state of equilibrium. So it is in disorder. And the process that permaculture tries to work through is building order from disorder, assisting, assisting nature in, in moving toward uh, an orderly and uh, self-sustaining system. And so that's what we're working toward with permaculture. Um, so, so the test of order versus chaos is you know, is everything, uh, order is a state where everything's working together, beneficially self-sustaining. Um, chaos is a situation where it is uh, releasing more energy than it is collecting. Um, so when you are reestablishing now, I'm gonna talk about reestablishing order from chaos, you need to introduce species. And you need to do that carefully. You don't want to introduce species that can take over and um, and will, if if your system goes back toward a a state of equilibrium, you don't want to introduce species that will change the order of things after you're gone. So if you introduce something like a hardy kiwi and you're not properly managing it and you do not have any way of eliminating that before you walk away from your system, you have introduced an element of disorder because that is not something that, if you're in New England, I should say, that is not something that belongs in our natural ecosystem, but it is something that will continue to outcompete lots of things in our natural e ecosystem. If you look in, in the South, they introduced something called kudzu in southern United, the Southern United States, something called kudzu. Now that is an edible plant, very usable plant, very very helpful plant in many ways where it belongs, but it doesn't belong in Georgia. And so it was introduced, it was not maintained, and it couldn't be controlled, and it has taken over and really changed the environment there. Now, it's not something you can get rid of, so the environment is working towards an equilibrium, but it's going to be a long time before it really hits that equilibrium with respect to that kudzu introduction. Um, but there's very little that humans can do to control that now. So that's something you want to avoid. Um, example, other examples are like the autumn olive. Now this is a fruit that I really like and glad to have it, but I'm not so glad that it has it is displacing other species that that really belong in certain areas in the United States. And, and this is, you know, it's taking over this niche that other species used to fill, but aren't strong enough to compete with the autumn olive. So it's another thing, you know, so you want to think about what people call invasive species. Some of these, you know, will, uh, there's just nothing you can do about eradicating the autumn olive anymore. And so today's autumn olive is, um, is going to be tomorrow's dandelion. It will become part of the, the system and the system will work toward finding an equil equilibrium that works with the autumn olive. Uh, but, and that's true of kudzu, eventually, this, the, the, but, but in the process, it's kind of destructive. And so be careful of that when introducing species in this effort to, um, to create order out of chaos. And you can use things like, say, uh, dandelions, which they came in as an introduced species 400 years ago, kind of reached an equi equilibrium with the environment. Dandelions are a great way to, um, they're, they're a, a species that comes in in a de degraded landscape and can help to rebuild it. So that's an example. You can use clover, uh, which is a, 
species that is, uh, I believe it's a native species here, and that, although there are different kinds of clover, some are, some aren't, but clover is something that will, um, will help to uh, rebuild a degraded landscape. So you think about species that can survive initially when you're trying to rebuild, and then you can add other species uh, building order on that chaos. But here's where, I'm gonna tell you where I, I, I kind of have a, uh, it's, it's not a disagreement with Mollison exactly, but it's building on his theory of order and chaos, but also on his theory of edges. Now, when you think about what, when we talk about edges with respect to permaculture, it's a very productive space. So the edge of a field at the edge of a forest, often more productive than the forest or the field, right? So if we want to build a truly um, ordered system, a system that is in equilibrium, there may not be as much for us as individuals to consume out of that system. What I am shooting for is a system somewhere between that state of chaos and the state of pure equilibrium, because a state of pure equilibrium really doesn't have as much surplus as you would get at that edge between chaos and order. And that, using that edge theory with this order of chaos and, and, and order, you end up with more growth. So let's think about this with respect to something you know tangible, like an apple tree. So you plant an apple tree, and in the beginning, you put it into a new environment, you've kind of introduced something, it's a state of disorder, but you're moving perhaps toward a state of equilibrium when that apple tree might be at full uh, size and full development. So you, you introduce that apple tree, you don't get much production early on. And then at a certain point, if you take care of that apple tree and you maintain it and you prune it, you have a whole lot of production. But that is a pruned apple tree. That is not a, an apple tree in a state of equilibrium. An apple tree in a state of equilibrium is tall, it's wide, it's difficult to harvest, and it is not producing perfect apples. In fact, what it's producing is apples that are consumed in the state of equilibrium by other elements in the system. So you might think of them as pests, but really what they're doing is they are they're helping to facilitate that state of equilibrium with respect to that apple tree. So these pests consume the apples and create a state of balance between that apple tree and the environment. Now, do you want an environment where your pests are creating that state of equilibrium, or do you want an environment where you are able to take advantage of the most, the most energetic growth of that tree? So what you want to do, and what we're essentially doing when we're growing things like apples, is we are keeping that tree from reaching its full potential as a, an element in a state of equilibrium because it's not as useful to us when it is in that perfect state of equilibrium. Other things are taking care of the fruit, but you don't want other things taking care of the fruit. You want to take care of the fruit. You want to consume the fruit. So you need to keep that tree from reaching its full equilibrium if you want maximum uh, abundance from that tree with respect to your own needs. I'm not talking about abundance within, with respect to the system. A lot of tiny, warped little apples can be very abundant for the system itself, but not for you. And so we, we plant these things for ourselves, not for nature. If we were planting things for nature, we wouldn't be planting apple trees in New England because apple trees aren't natural in New England. Um, we plant them for ourselves. So in keeping that tree pruned, we create maximum abundance because that is actually, for ourselves, that is actually that meeting point, that's that edge 
between order and order, order and chaos. We'll put, we'll put order up here, we'll put chaos down here. You got that edge right there and that is where you're going to get the most useful products out of your food forest, out of your gardens, is that edge between order and chaos. Not complete chaos and not complete order. That is my own, my own take on this, and I would be really interested to hear what you think about this idea that perhaps we're not aiming in our own backyard situations. We're not aiming for pure equilibrium. We want to have an equilibrium where we are part of that equilibrium, but we don't want the system to reach equilibrium on its own. And so an, a situation where we are part of that equilibrium involves us disturbing that equilibrium to harvest things and to keep things at a productive level. And that can be somewhere between the chaos of a flat lawn and the order of a mature forest. So that is my take. I want to hear what you think. Please respond down in the comments below. I would love a thumbs up, uh, and I would love it if you would subscribe to this channel. Also, please check out the foodforestgardenclub.org where we get together online. We talk about ideas like this, and we, uh, and we share plants and, and, uh, and seeds and things like that. And it's just a, it's a really good time. So check it out, foodforestgardenclub.org. You can also reach me via the contact form at the bottom of that page. All right. Thank you so much for your attention this morning. I hope I was entertaining enough, and I hope you have a wonderful day.